and welcome everyone good evening good morning or good afternoon wherever you may be and thank you very much for uh for, for joining us and thank you very much for this great introduction uh, it's a pleasure to be here so today we're going to talk about WebAssembly and the JavaScript. And the title of this talk is, you know, supercharge your JavaScript with, with WebAssembly or with WASM. And what we're going to do today is go through my set of slides. I have about, you know, 20 slides or so, so I'm not going to just show you slides because I have a couple of examples of real projects that I worked on that use WebAssembly and use JavaScript, and I'm going to showcase those uh, to you as well. Um, I got a very good introduction, so I'm not going to reintroduce myself to you. Um, instead, I thought that we're going to start with a joke. So the question is, why do, and I'm, I'm already laughing, this is going to be a terrible joke, by the way. So why do programmers leave their job? And the reason why they leave their job is because they don't get a raise. Now, if you don't get the joke, you know, a raise, a raise. Now, at this point, I wish I could see your face. Um, you may, <laughs> please don't quit. I promise this is the last joke, right? So, so bear with me. We're going to talk about WebAssembly and cool stuff. I promise it to you. Okay, so on a more serious note, if you think about the web platform, and, and if you think about the web platform as it was back, you know, two, three, or three years ago in, in 2018, this, the, the sort of execution engines that you had in the, the browser uh, were these two things. You have, you know, a, a bunch of web APIs, you know, things like the Fetch API and, and, and all the other APIs, notification API, and, and, you know, there's at least 20, if not more, web APIs that you can use uh, in JavaScript in the browser. And browsers also contain a virtual machine. And in, you know, up until 2018, the, the virtual machine inside the browser was able to execute JavaScript code, okay? That's, you know, a very sort of simple view of what the browser is doing, right? So virtual machine to execute JavaScript code, and you can access the web APIs. Now, we all know how, you know, the web is progressing and, and you know, the, the stuff that comes out is, is really great. So we essentially went from utilizing servers to utilizing the browser a lot more. In fact, in today's web ecosystem and, and in today when you create all your web applications, you use the browser as your main execution engine. And of course, with that, you use JavaScript and it fits very well into this ecosystem. So there's you know vanilla JavaScript and, and a bunch of JavaScript frameworks that developers are using, but JavaScript has certain limits. First of all, it was never meant to be used so heavily, you know, it, it, it has certain features that are really great for the web, but there are certain functionalities that you can't do in a performant way using JavaScript. So it, it's relatively difficult to achieve low level tasks, you know, inside your browser using JavaScript without paying a performance penalty, right? There are things that you can do, you know, low level processing, computationally heavy processing, you can do it and there are ways that you can make that work happen in a performant way, like, you know, use web workers and other stuff, but JavaScript is not for that. And you may still pay a performance penalty for that. So that's why people started to think about another way to bring low level code execution to the web platform. And in light of that, back in 2015, this thing called WebAssembly was created. Now, there's one you know, slight note on this slide is that there was this thing called ASM.js, which predates WebAssembly by two years. Um, I think ASM.js was created by the researchers at Mozilla, um, if I remember correctly. But essentially that you know, ASM.js allowed developers to run applications created using the C language as a web application. So effectively taking something that was written in a relatively low level language like C and run it on the web in the browser. And that is really you know, the, the father of WebAssembly because WebAssembly allows us to do exactly that. And as of 2019, December of 2019, WebAssembly made it to be a W3C recommendation, 
right? So it has a proper spec. You can go to W3C website, you can read it. And WebAssembly is now part of the web ecosystem. So what is WebAssembly? So I, I do have the sort of official explanation here, which I took from, from uh, MDN, uh, Mozilla's website. And it states that WebAssembly is a low level assembly-like language with a compact binary format that runs with a near native performance and provides languages such as C, C++, and Rust with a compilation target so that they can run on the web. That's a mouthful, isn't it? That's, that's a very uh, good, but a relatively complex explanation. So I came up with my version, and that's run native apps on the web, right? So basically, take your C application, take your C++ application or your Rust application, and just run it on the web, run it in your browser. That's essentially what we're talking about here when we talk about WebAssembly. And the great thing about WebAssembly, and because it's part of the this whole web ecosystem, the way WebAssembly was created is that it can access JavaScript, or it can talk to, or it can communicate with JavaScript. So you have WebAssembly functions that can be exposed to JavaScript, right? So you can create a, you know, a C++ application, or you have an existing C++ application. It has functions, it has methods that you want to access on the web. You can expose those for JavaScript, and you can just invoke them, and then WebAssembly will execute those. And there's one sort of slight misconception that I've heard a bunch of times, you know, when I talk to people about WebAssembly, and then they say, you know, oh, WebAssembly is going to replace JavaScript. And that's not true. WebAssembly is, wasn't created to replace JavaScript at all. It is going to enhance it, or it is actually enhancing it, it's augmenting it, right? So it's giving that additional power to JavaScript that JavaScript doesn't have, right? So it allows us to do low-level code execution, something that JavaScript is not really good at. And now JavaScript can actually talk to WebAssembly to do that low-level code execution. So if you take a look at the web platform as it is today, browsers, so these are you know modern browsers that we're talking about here, they still have the web APIs, but they do have two separate virtual machines. They have a or actually, it's maybe one virtual machine. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not exactly sure about this uh, part at this moment. But there's this virtual machine that we discussed, which is able to execute JavaScript code. But there's also a virtual machine that is now capable of executing WebAssembly code. OK, and that is now part of the browser. And because of this setup, and this is you know a very simple way to show the architecture of, of a browser, of course. But what I'm trying to highlight here is that because you have the JavaScript code execution and the WebAssembly code execution uh, happening in the browser, those things can communicate with each other. Those things can interact with each other, right? There's no, there's sort of no uh, uh, boundaries that would separate these things that would allow that wouldn't allow you to to make that connection between the two. Um, there's also this thing called the WebAssembly JavaScript API, um, which essentially allows you to do a couple of things, right? So th the JavaScript API for WebAssembly means that you can actually work with a WebAssembly file. And you can do things like load them. Or you can create memory and table instances. Um, and effectively, when you work with a WebAssembly module, you can think of those as just a standard ES6 or ES2050 module, which you import into your application. The, the WebAssembly JavaScript API works using promises. You can just load your WebAssembly. And then once you do that, you can access the WebAssembly memory. There's a file system that you can access, which is you know, going to open up all sorts of very interesting possibilities for you. Um, and then you can just access all the functions from WebAssembly inside JavaScript. It's really, really simple. So what that means in terms of you know, creating a, a, a WebAssembly file, which, by the way, has the uh, .wasm uh, extension. So that's why I have this slide titled as um, process of creating a, a WASM. So that's a, a WASM file, which is a WebAssembly file, effectively, or a WebAssembly module, even. <clears throat> so the process of this is you, know, you, you create your application. and, and there are sort of two ways that you can do this. Either 
you know, write something from scratch in C, C++, or as I say, in any other LLVM supported language. Um, so LLVM is, is a, um, a, a, a low level virtual machine. Uh, effectively, it's a compiler infrastructure. Um, and there are other programming languages that use that, you know, C Sharp, Haskell, Objective-C, and, and, and others. So you either write something in C or C++, for example, and then you use this tool called mscripten, and you specify your compilation target to be WebAssembly. It you know, will generate that WebAssembly file for you, and then you take that WebAssembly file and then load it and consume that using JavaScript in the browser. The other sort of way to do this is that you take something that already existed. So you take an existing C or C++ project, and you want, and if you want to bring that to the web, you again run it through MScript and compilation target WASM, and then you do the loading and consumption of that. Now there are of course other uh, programming languages that you can use to create WebAssembly modules and WebAssembly files. So you could create what we would call a non NLVM supported languages. So languages like .NET, uh, Java, Ruby, Go, etc. All of these languages can now compile to WebAssembly as well. So you write your code using one of these languages, or you take an already existing application that you've wrote using these languages, you compile it to WebAssembly, and the process is going to be the same. You load it and consume it via JavaScript. And the list doesn't stop here because there are a vast, <clears throat> excuse me, a vast, a vast number of programming languages that compile to WebAssembly. So .NET, C, C++, we mentioned those, C Sharp, D, F Sharp, Go, Java, PHP, Python, and there's TypeScript as well. So believe it or not, there's this thing called, I think it's called AssemblyScript, which allows you to write very strict and type-safe TypeScript, and then you can create WebAssembly from that as well. Uh, there's this person, um, or maybe that's an organization, I'm, I'm not sure, I can't remember now, uh, that collected a list of languages that compile to WebAssembly. So you can take a look at that link. And in that repository, you have a list. And it's not only a list of languages that do support a WebAssembly, it also gives you uh, information whether it has full support, partial support, or support you know, coming soon or, or in progress. OK. so. That's a very brief introduction to, to WebAssembly and, and what you can do, but let me demo a couple of sort of applications that I created um, using WebAssembly. And I think we have about four of them that I'm going to go through. Uh, there's going to be two that I'm going to demonstrate uh, in the beginning, very basic applications, just to show you the sort of process of creating WebAssembly files and then to how to consume them using JavaScript. And then the other two applications are going to be slightly more complex. And those are applications that are, are you know, I'm using and there's, you know, some other people are using that for very specific reasons. Okay, so demo time. Um, let's go to my editor. In the chat, you can let me know if you think this font size is, you know, too small, so just let me know. <clears throat> um, we did test this. I think this, you know, this is like a six-time zoom, so I'm hoping uh, people can uh, can read it. Uh, Mark is asking, no mention of Rust. Um, Rust is another one. I, I didn't uh, list all of the languages because that would have been, you know, just a, a full slide with all the languages. Rust is is again something that compiles to WebAssembly. Okay, so there's you know Rust, Go. Take a look at that list, uh, and it's likely that you're going to find your programming language of choice there. <clears throat> right, so two very simple examples that I, that I want to show you. First one is square.c. Now, you know, quick disclaimer here. What I'm trying to show you here is how to create a WebAssembly file and how to consume that on the web using JavaScript in the browser. I know that JavaScript can do mathematical operations like this, okay? That's, that's not the point. Uh, the point is we have a C function and then we're going to invoke this C function using JavaScript in the browser, okay? But I, I wanted to keep things as simple as possible. So here we have a very simple C file, square.c. Um, 
And I mentioned this tool called mscripten. So mscripten will allow us to take a C or C++ application and specify the compilation target to be WebAssembly. And in order to do that, I am including the mscripten headers. Uh, I added this keep alive uh, um, line here. And then we just specify you know, the simplest C function that we have, which is in square, it takes an integer and it will return the square value uh, or the squared number. Now, in order to create the WebAssembly file, what I had to do was execute this particular command that you see here. I'm not going to execute it now because I've already done it before this workshop. Uh, do notice that I'm running emcc, which is the mscript and compiler. Uh, it's something that you need to set up. Uh, it's very well documented. So if you just Google for mscripten, you will be taken to, I think, probably it's mscripten.com or something similar. It's very easy to set it up. Once you set it up, you will be able to execute this emcc command as well. So what I do is, you know, emcc, state that compiler, specify the C file. I say WebAssembly is our target. I can also do extra exported runtime methods. So I could do the C wrap. Um, I could do additional uh, exported methods, or I could specify uh, additional exported methods here. And then what I do is dash O square.js. And I'm going to tell you what this square.js does in, in just a second. So if you execute this command, you're going to end up having two separate files. There's going to be a square.js and a square.wesm file. So this is your WebAssembly module. And then you have this square.js which it looks like a very sort of you know complicated JavaScript, but this is the JavaScript file that I will need to load inside my web application. So let's take a look at how I can bring in this square, you know, WebAssembly module to index.html or, or to into my browser. So notice that what I have in my HTML, I'm going to open this uh, open this in, in my browser in just a moment. But what I have here is an input box with an ID number. So this is where we're going to, as I'm sure you can guess, add a number. Then I have a button ID calculates. If we hit that button, I would expect the result of that calculation to come back to this result paragraph. Okay, so very simple. So I'm including square.js. I'm including the generated JavaScript file in here. And then I have access, because uh, I, I added square.js, I have access to this thing called the module, which is, as part of the mscript and process, square.js exports a module, which then has access to my WebAssembly module, which I can then call in my JavaScript in the browser. I then say on runtime initialize, so I'm basically initializing my WebAssembly file. And what I've done, and there are many ways to do this, but this, I think, for demonstration purposes, it's the easiest. I take, uh, or I create an object called API. I call, uh, or, or I create a, a property on that API object called calculate square. And I basically specify module.cwrap. Now remember, cwrap was something that I exported as part of the WebAssembly creation. And what this allows me to do is to specify three parameters. The first one is the C function that I would like to call, which is int underscore square. And then I need to specify the return type. And, and I always mix up these two parameters. So the first one is either the return type for the method here. And then the second parameter is the argument data type, right? So if you remember square.c expects an integer and will return an integer. Okay, so I'm just specifying that it is a number and that's a number as well. So return type and argument, or maybe it's, it's the other way around. I can't remember now. Maybe you can, but there's no help in Visual Studio Code for this. Okay, so that's that. And then I go ahead and, and write standard JavaScript, right? So I basically call get element by ID calculate on the button. I then add a click event listener for the button. Um, I grab the value as well from the input box. So this is you know standard JavaScript. And then I just call api.calculate square and I pass in the input number. So effectively take that number from the input box and I pass it into this calculate square um, 
uh, method that I have on my API object. And that is in turn going to call in square and it's going to pass in the input number as a parameter and it's going to return us a number. So let's run this. And as I said, you know, this is really not displaying the capabilities of, uh, sorry, wrong screen. There we go. Uh, it's really not, you know, demonstrating the true capabilities and value of WebAssembly. But, you know, once you get an application like this right and you understand how to, you know, bring in a, uh, how to create a C file, how to transform that to WebAssembly, how to load that WebAssembly, how to load the functions and how to call those, you know, a more complex application is going to be, uh, uh, it's going to be very easy for you to, to do that. So we have calculate, uh, you know, I had two calculate and then we get four. So this four is actually coming back from the C int square method. And, and that's that's pretty much it, okay? There's, there's no magic, but now calculate doesn't call anything in JavaScript per se, it is invoking the calculation from WebAssembly. As I said, you know, simple, simple example. Now, the other example that I have here is called cube.go. And I'm sure you can guess what, what this is going to do. Um, it's a cube, and, and you will see some differences in here. The C example was relatively straightforward. The Go example and the way how Go creates WebAssembly, it's you know it's not my favorite, but you know it's it's worth mentioning as well. So if you know Go, then this is going to be very sort of straightforward for you to understand. But what happens here is first of all, I have an extra import for Cisco slash JS. So we're going to be needing this if we want to. Uh, create a WebAssembly file from this Go file. Then I create a cube function. And notice that I have access to JS value and inputs, which is a JS value array. And this is going to be important because I can directly pass in uh, parameters from JavaScript to this cube method. I read the number. So if I essentially going to accept a number and I'm going to you know, cube that number. And that's what I'm going to return. But look at how I'm returning it. I'm actually from my Go code, I'm calling document get element by ID result, and I'm setting the inner HTML to be the result. So it, I am basically I am directly communicating with my document object model from my Go script. Of course, this is Go, but you know, ultimately we're going to uh, create WebAssembly. So it's going to be um, uh, a WebAssembly file that will communicate with our DOM. And then I have a, a, a main command and I then expose the cube function and make it available for JavaScript. Now you see this is a slightly different way than, than how the, the C uh, version, you know, in inverted commas version worked. But still, it's going to you know, result in the same behavior. Now, in order for us to, to create the WebAssembly file from this Go file, you need to run this. So we need to set the architecture to be WASM, and then we just call Go build, and then we you know, create, uh, in this case, I call the file cube.wasm. Now, what's interesting is that if you run this command, again, you're going to receive two files. First of all, you're going to get cube.wasm, as you see here on the on the left hand side, but this is also going to produce wasm underscore exec.js. Or in fact, let me think. I can't remember if this is going to be. It's maybe something that you need to get from the Go website. Uh, and I just edit here. I can't recall this from the top of my head. But this wasm execution file or this wasm exec.js is something that you will need to add to your HTML. And this is going to allow you to execute the cube.wasm file that you created from Go. So this file is just specific to the Go programming language. So let's see how this works in this file called index-go.html. So again, I uh, add wasm.exe. And this time around, the loading is slightly different. 
So we are going to instantiate the WebAssembly source. So with these, uh, actually, if, if I remember correctly, this is a this is something that I edit because I think Safari didn't support this version. So this is a workaround to make sure that lo the, the WebAssembly file loads in every uh, every browser in the same way. Now the reason why I can do cons go equals new go is because I have wasm execute the JS in here. So that's going to allow us to instantiate the effectively a simplified version of the Go runtime. Then I call WebAssembly dot uh, instantiate streaming. Now, what you could do as well is, you know, make sure that WebAssembly is available for your browser. So, you know, the classic uh, uh, checks that, uh, that you can do. I use the fetch API to then fetch the WebAssembly file. And as I said, this is a promise-based API. So this is the WebAssembly JavaScript API that you see here. And then I am going to create this module, create an instance, and I just call go run, and I'm going to run my instance. So if I run my instance, it means that everything that I created in my Go file, which now compile them to WebAssembly, will be accessible for me uh, in here. And what I do, have an input box again. I have a button here, and this time around, I didn't add a uh, separate script for the onClick handler or for the click handler, instead I'm using on click as an attribute here. And notice, I don't need to do anything. I can just access the function that I created in Go. So it's called cube. And effectively, because I am exporting it here, I can access it inside my HTML, inside JavaScript, inside anywhere. And I pass in document or get element by ID number dot value. And notice that I'm not setting anything for the result because remember, I am setting the result directly from Go. So this is almost like a two-way communication where I can access the DOM from Go, but because I'm exporting, well, exporting an inverted commas, uh, something here, I can also call the cube function from JavaScript, right? So it's this two-way communication happening between these two files. And so, Close this because it's the same server. I wonder where it's going to place it now. Right here. Okay. Um, so I need to go to slash index go.html. Okay, so I get my calculate button again. So if I do two, calculate eight. Uh, so that this is now cubing, right? So that's 27. So it's three times three times three. Again, the result and the calculation is not done in JavaScript, it is done by the underlying WebAssembly module, it's done by using Go. So these are, you know, some very similar, uh, very um, uh, simple examples, very straightforward. And, you know, you can do cubes and you can do square and you can square numbers using JavaScript just as fine. I'm not trying to advocate that you should use, um, uh, um, you know, <laughs> WebAssembly for, for simple things like this. But let me show you two other projects that I had a lot of fun uh, working with, which are going to be you know slightly more complex. Um, and again, I have two examples for you. Uh, so somebody is saying that, uh, okay, I'm hoping, uh, I was a person, uh, Claudia, Claudia da Silva. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, if not, as suggested, do refresh your browser, please. Okay, so two more examples. Um, so I just need to open those. Okay, here's one. Um, how should I do it? Should I show you what it does or should I explain it to you? Uh, let me explain this to you first. No, let me show it to you. I'm going to do serve. Again, I have... Um, two examples, two, two more complex examples, one using Go, the other one using uh, C++, actually. So let me bring this over to this screen right here. So I created this tool, uh, and it is called image check. So, uh, you know, I think it was mentioned that this particular um, uh, a talk is sponsored by Cloudinary. I also work for Cloudinary. And 
let me do a quick demo because I want you to understand what I'm going to show you. So for those of you who don't know, Cloud Engineering is a, uh, a cloud-based media management solution. So it means you can take your images and videos, upload it to, upload it to Cloudinary. Cloudinary will generate you an access URL and you can then utilize Cloudinary's optimization features, transformation features, and their CDN to distribute the media assets. So just to show you a quick example, let's imagine that we have this URL. Uh, let's do it this way. Split this into two halves so that you see what the actual URL is. So this is the URL that you have in my browser. So we're assuming we took this picture, uploaded it to Cloudinary, and we got a URL to access this. If you take a look at the network panel, we'll see that this particular file is, let's move this a little bit up. So this particular file is 583 kilobytes in size, and as expected, it is a JPEG. But I, I find this file, first of all, is way too big, right? It's, it's large in dimensions and it's li large in content length. So what Cloudinary can do, uh, there's a lot of things that Cloudinary can do, but, but let me show you this one thing, F underscore auto. So first of all, uh, if you work with, with images, then uh, images on the web, that is, you know that there's JPEG files, that you know that there's PNGs, you know that there's WebP. For example, WebP is a very particular image format because you know, Google created that and developed that image format, meaning that the Chrome browser supports it and it's a very efficient image encoding, but you try to open a WebP in Safari, it's not going to do anything because Safari doesn't support WebP. That's about to change, but you know, the majority of Safari versions out there will not open uh, a WebP. However, Safari is aware of the JPEG 2000 encoding. So theoretically, what we're saying here is that for an ideal optimized experience for your users in terms of performance, you should generate a WebP for Chrome, you should generate uh, a JPEG 2000 for Safari and a JPEG for everyone else. Now, with this F auto flag, what Cloudinary allows you to do, and I'm going to copy this and paste it in here, is that Cloudinary is going to take a look at your browser and it will say, well, you're using Chrome, so I'm going to, on the server side, generate a WebP and send that WebP for you because you know I can effectively encode that much more efficiently. So in fact, if I just hit enter here, uh, and I, what did I do? Image, I put it in the wrong place, sorry. It's here, F underscore two. So you will see that we went from 583 kilobytes to just, to just 50 kilobytes purely because this file is now a WebP file. And we have features like Q underscore auto, which will take a look at every single image that you pass into it. It's going to analyze the image and reduce the quality of the image without losing what we call visual fidelity. So if effectively what I'm saying is that the image is going to still look the same for the human eye. Okay, so we do this test. So this is now 49 kilobytes. We load this new URL. The size goes down to 32 kilobytes. We haven't even touched the dimensions, but we saved a lot of kilobytes over the wire. So this is what Cloudium does. Uh, at least, you know, this is about 1% of what Cloudium is doing. But how is this relevant to what we're talking about here? So. I basically built this tool because I wanted to know not only the fact that the image that I get back from Cloudinary is a JPEG or it's a PNG or it's a WebP, I wanted to further analyze the image. I wanted to know what version of PNG we're talking about. Does it does it have interlacing? Does it have an alpha channel? You know, if it's a WebP image, which kind of WebP container are we talking about VP8, VP8L, and there's you know there's lots of differences in between. So basically, I wanted to do lower level analysis of the images that are being returned from Cloudinary, and because I wanted to do some lower level image processing, I really you know I probably could have done it in JavaScript, but then you know are there client client side JavaScript 
libraries available that would allow you to sort of read the first couple of bytes of a PNG and analyze it? I don't know. Maybe there are, but I went down with the whoever assembly group. So what this tool allows me to do, uh, and of course, you know, you could do this with any other uh, image CDM probably, or, or you could analyze your images as well. I just hard coded this first bit of the cloud in the URL, and then we have this, you know, the, the last couple of bits, and this is, you know, uh, an F auto on this particular JPEG file. I have the user agent, so I'm using Chrome this time around. So if I hit check, then this is a JPEG image. Here are the dimensions, and I also grab the sort of quality of the image. You know, what, what is the quality of this image? You do need to take this value with a, you know, hit, pinch of salt because it's not always accurate. You know, what if I now add Q auto? Will things change around? Well, let's see. And we're going to do a check. Well, the, the size went down. Uh, you know, that's great. So what if I change the dimensions of this image uh, with 500, for example? Uh, well, notice if we shrink the image, so W underscore 500 will create, will render a width 500 pixel image, an image with a width of 500 pixels. I can't speak English today. I'm sorry. Um, and notice that the the, the, the file type that we get back from Cloudinary now changed. So it is now rendering a WebP, which is of a VP8 container. The size is 49 kilobytes. The dimensions are, of course, you know, 500 by whatever, because that's what we, we set. This is using a lossy uh, encoding, and it doesn't have an alpha channel, meaning there are no transparent bits in this particular WebP. Great. So what if, you know, what would Cloudinary render if I were to use Safari? Now, I have this trick for you because I'm, I'm sure you know that you can't change the user agent programmatically. But if you use Chrome and if you use the DevTools, there's this wonderful thing called network conditions, which will, if you uncheck the select automatically checkbox, allow you to set any user agent and is going to mock and pretends to be a Safari Mac, and is going to send this particular user agent. So notice this user agent updated here as well. I don't know how much you paid attention to this, but this is now the Safari you know, Mac OS uh, user agent. So let's run check again. And notice that this is now a JPEG of 50 kilobytes, quality 77. Okay, so completely different response because I changed the user agent. Um, I did some tests with my other image. So it was um, a JPEG. I think this should return us on Safari a JPEG 2000, right? So it allows me to analyze my image further. So just saying it's a JPEG, it's telling me that this is JPEG 2000. And I have some more information on things like uh, PNGs. So I have, and you're going to laugh now, but this is this is for real. Darth Vader, the PNG, which is actually an image about Darth Vader. Uh, long story. <laughs> and um, so if I hit check, notice that I'm not just saying that it's a PNG. I'm actually telling what specific type of PNG we're talking about. So the different types of PNGs, you know, PNG 8, 32, 24, I think. So this is a PNG32. It has a bit depth of eight. It's true color with an alpha channel, and it's not using interlacing. Uh, if I change things around, so maybe let's add uh, F underscore auto. But now it, F auto decides, well, actually a JPEG 2000 is much more suitable for displaying this particular image for Mac OS X. Uh, you know, I could change to, I don't know, Microsoft Internet Explorer 11. In that case, okay, <laughs> let's ignore that. I don't know, it's probably my tool that doesn't uh, work right well with Internet Explorer. Um, but if you take a look at Chrome, this is now, again, a different one. This is now a WebP with a VP8X container which has an alpha channel. Anyway, you get the idea, right? So I'm basically analyzing uh, uh, the image here. And this actually allowed us uh, to, to do some, some debugging. So that was this issue with, well, not really sure, a question from, from one of uh, our customers. Um, they had this particular image. 
right here, which is, actually, I should probably open that image. And they basically apply, and you don't see the URL again, so I do apologize for that. So this is the URL. And what they do, they set a um, uh, some colors on this image, okay? And, and they do have some, some other transformations in here, which we're not going to get into. But what happened was that based on the Q auto value, the colors of the image changed. Okay, so when it was rendering a PNG, it changed. When it was rendering a JPEG, it changed. And with the help of this tool, we were able to figure out that the reason why this color changed is because Q Auto decided to generate different versions of PNGs. So sometimes with more color, sometimes with a with, a, with less colors, with a with a smaller color palette. Um, and this caused some very tiny color differences between a Q Auto and a non Q Auto version of the image. But anyway, you, you get the idea of what um, uh, uh, what we can uh, uh, do here. Now, in terms of the code, and, and I want to uh, crack on with this um, because I have another example to show you. Um, so, in terms of the code, the way I've I've constructed this is I have a separate sort of uh, I don't know how to call this even like package. Uh, they call them packaging go so separate package for checking jpeg separate package for checking png separate package for che checking web piece um you know should i want to maybe in the future check for avif files i can just you know create a new package here and and use that so the web p check well, let's take let's take the png check so the png check um i don't even know where to show you the uh the, the most important bit here um Where is the bit that I, I read the, uh, the image? So, so basically, using Go, I can take the image data buffer. So I can take the buffer of the image, feed that in here, and I can run it through, for example, uh, this PNG, oh, that should say version. So PNG version, that's interesting, uh, PNG version method. So I pass in the, the buffer of the PNG. I read the 20, uh, third and the 24th value, one is going to tell me the bit depth, one is going to tell me the color type, and now I can compare these. So if the bit depth is eight and the color type is three, then it is labeled as a PNG eight. And, and I use the PNG specification to come up with this, right? So there's PNG eight, PNG 24, PNG 32. The difference is that, you know, they would contain uh, more colors and, and different color palette. So I do, you know, something similar for WebP. Uh, I, I read all the information, the low-level information from, from WebP to determine, you know, whether the WebP image has an alpha channel, meaning there are transparent parts of it. Uh, what kind of, you know, WebP container we're talking about. And I'm not going to get into that, but if you're interested, you can take a look at the, the WebP specification. I then put everything together in this file called main.go. Uh, I call, you know, everything in here. And it, it, what you've seen in the cube.go file, everything is, you know, similar to this, except it's just, you know, more code. But effectively, as you can see, I'm, I'm setting a response text. I'm directly typing in HTML in here. And that gets read inside my HTML uh, here because I fetched the WebAssembly file and I can now call uh, I can call this invoke button, pass in the cloud in your URL, and the user agent that invokes my method from this file called invoke. So that's what I'm exposing here. Uh, and where is invoke? Right here. Invoke, in, come on, invoke, right? So I pass in the URL, pass in the, um, the user agent, and I just read the buffer of the image and do all the processing that I have to. So I'm not going to go through this in, in, in depth, but I hope you know you, you kind of get the idea of, of, of what I'm what I'm doing here. So that's one example. And the other example, because I promised you two, is a project that took me many long days and, and nights to to uh, uh, to convert. And it's called Simulacra. 
So Simulacra was a project that a couple of colleagues of mine at Cloudinary has have created back in 2017. So there's this colleague of mine, Jon, uh, who is an uh, an image researcher. So he does, you know, he, he writes specifications for JPEG now. So, so he's, you know, really doing uh, some interesting things uh, with the images. And he created this C++ file called Simulacra, which is Structural Similarity Unveiling Local and Compression Rated Artifacts. So that's, that's, a very, that's a mouthful. But what it means, it's a tool that is capable of comparing two images and it's going to return you a number. The closer that number is to zero, the more similar the images are. And it's a very great tool to compare visual uh, deficiencies of images. So you have you know, maybe an image that's very low quality and you have the image with very high quality, you expect those two images to have a very uh, uh, large number. So it's going to be like 0 0.83. Whereas if the images are uh, closer to zero, so maybe the simulacra result is 0 0.003, it means those images are very, very close to each other. And the reason why we created this tool or why he created this tool was to uh, to be able to justify how our Q auto works, how this automatic quality reduction works. And Simulacra actually took real user data into consideration. So it's not just uh, a computational algorithm. We did some research back in 2017. We asked, I don't know how many hundreds of users, we asked them to compare two images. We took the result of that and this Simulacra.cpp file was born. I'm not going to go through this because Personally, I don't understand half of this. Um, but what matters is that this was just a common line tool, right? So you could do, you know, you could compile this uh, uh, C++ project and you could run it from the command line and that's it. And I thought, hang on, wouldn't this be amazing as a WebAssembly file and run it on the internet so that I can compare images? And so I decided to, uh, to, to do, run this project uh, or to create this project, uh, let me tell you, it was quite the challenge because there were some change that I had to change in this, uh, in this file. Um, some because it was re referencing some older uh, headers, but eventually I managed to make it work. Uh, I run it through mscripton because this is now C++. I run it through mscripton and oh my God, I'm running out of time. Um, do, I, do I get five more minutes? I'm sorry, I didn't realize that that's, yes, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I'm just going to show you what it does. So I run it through mscript and it generated me this simulacro.javascript file. It created me this simulacro wesm file. And what's really interesting is that with the WebAssembly JavaScript API, I can actually write files to this, uh, to the virtual machine's file system. And if I write files, I can write, write files to that file system from WebAssembly and I can read that as well. So what this particular project is doing, is taking those two images, it's going to grab them, it's going to read, uh, write them on disk, it's going to run the simulacra uh, calculation and it's going to return a result and add that result to HTML. Again, slightly more uh, complex code, but effectively, this is very similar to the square.c approach that I, I was uh, showing you before. So let's check this. So let's run this even. And the look and feel is going to be very similar. Um, let's maximize this, right. So I have this image here. And again, I'm just using Cloudium, right? So this is the black car that we saw before. Very nice image, very crisp. And then I'm using Q1, which is going to generate a quality one, the lowest quality possible for an image. And I don't know how much this is coming through the stream, but this is an awful looking image. You know, it's pixelated. It's, you know, it's clearly a very low quality image. Now, if I hit calculate the similarity, uh, it does take a couple of seconds because there's a lot of processing and calculation that needs to take place. It's 0 0.4. So this is a very large number, meaning that these two images 
are, well, they are similar to each other because it's the same, but because of the quality reduction, we, you know, it, it's very bad. That, that's what this is effectively saying. So if I remove, you know, Q1 and I say, actually, if I just compare the two images, we'll get a zero because effectively these are the two images, uh, two of the same images. And if I do Q, say, 90, so the quality 90 for the JPEG, I'm going to get something like 0 0.00 something something, so 0 0.006, right? So this is a very small number. Uh, actually, I, I messed it up, I'm sorry. The closer the number is to 1, the worse. The closer to 0, the better, okay? So this is very, very close to 0, meaning that these images uh, are very similar to each other. And what we use what we do with this tool is we actually test our QAuto feature, whether QAuto is going to reduce the quality of the image in a way that it's not going to affect the human eye, okay? And we calculate the similarity using QAuto, which is going to pick the most appropriate quality value, 0 0.03, that's more than fine, right? It's still very close to zero, and users will not be affected by this quality reduction. This is what we effectively say, okay? So the interesting thing about this project was that I, I managed to take something that was pur purposefully written for uh, the CLI using C++, and I managed to port it to the web using WebAssembly, and admittedly, you know, a, a lot of work. And, and as part of this process, you know, I, I discovered, what, you know, things like, hey, I can actually write stuff to uh, this virtual file system, and I can read stuff from it. So it's very, very useful. Uh, and that file system is, is available for JavaScript and for WebAssembly as well for it to read. Uh, it's super interesting. Okay. Uh, we had the demo time. So I'm going to wrap this up, and I, I think there's a lot of questions in, in the chat as well. Uh, I'm hoping there's, there's a way that we can distribute the, the slides for you. Um, you know, a bunch of... Um, uh, links for you, you know, Mscripton, there's a lot of good stuff on, on MDN's website, uh, you know, squoosh.app, uh, if you follow what Google is doing, so squoosh.app is actually using WebAssembly as well for, for doing sort of image transformations and optimization in the browser. They took that to the next level because it also acts as a progressive web app. So for those of you who are familiar with progressive web apps, because you have a WebAssembly file, a .wesm file, effectively you can cache that so you can actually create an application that uses WebAssembly and it works offline. So that's, again, you know, opens up a lot of possibilities for you. Uh, and I really like this article or this case study from Google where they compared this thing or the hot path uh, using WebAssembly where they compare something created, I think it's in maybe Rust or C++ compiled down to WebAssembly and the same stuff created in JavaScript. And they have this really nice performance comparison uh, between these. And then you can read that case study there. So a bunch of links for you. Um, Wasm by example also has, I think someone ported, and I want to say Doom or, or one of these, you know, classic games written in, you know, C++ or whatever. Uh, compile it down to WebAssembly, and now you can just play it on, uh, on the web in, in your browser. So super interesting stuff uh, right there. Okay. So thank you. That's uh, all what I had for you. Uh, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, this presentation. And now let's see your questions. I don't know how you want to uh, uh, yeah. do this. Thanks for the talk, Tanis. I'll, I'll go through the questions for you because you did answer a couple of them as you went along. So um, okay. first question, if you go to developer tools, can you see the connection between the WebAssembly and the JavaScript or are you only going to see the JavaScript that's been generated? Um, a very quick answer for you. So there was a the latest conference from Google um, Chrome Dev Summit. So if you take a look at the latest Chrome Dev Summit, there's a talk by, I'm forgetting the name of the person, one of the Googlers. Uh, the latest Chrome Dev Tools added additional debugging and discovery features for WebAssembly. Have a look at his talk. He actually tells you how you can see the original 
uh, uh, WebAssembly, so the original code that you generate the WebAssembly from in DevTools or something very similar. So there's lots of capabilities that you can do. So, you know, connections, you can do debugging. So you can do live debugging using uh, DevTools for your WebAssembly. You can do tracing, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff. Uh, take a look at that. It's about a half an hour talk. Uh, unfortunately, I'm forgetting the guy's name. So it's in the latest Chrome Dev Summit. Uh, if you go to YouTube, just do you know Chrome Dev Summit 2020 or 20 yeah 2020 uh, and do WebAssembly and you'll find it. Cool. Okay, so that answers another question somebody's asked about the debugging capabilities. So go and have a look okay. at this Chrome Dev Summit and uh, search for the WebAssembly talk, which is about half an hour long. Cool. Thanks for that. Can we do async functions via WebAssembly? I assume async functions from the JavaScript side. Um, so, so I'm not sure what, what, what you're asking here, but you can, so the, the WebAssembly JavaScript API is promise based. So instead of using then, you could use async await if, if that's your question. Cool. If that isn't the question, please come back into the chat and uh, clarify that. And they've asked another question. If you need to process a huge object inside the function, inside WebAssembly, is there a transfer overhead like with web workers? I suppose so. D depends on the size of the object, of course. Um, I, I don't have experience with that, so I can only do some guesswork here. I would assume, you know, the larger the file is, probably. Uh, there's also things that you can do uh, when you, and I've done this with mscripten, you can extend the allocated memory for your WebAssembly uh, file. So by default, when you don't specify anything, mscripten will just, you know, allocate I don't know, 25 megabytes of memory. That, that's not true, I'm just saying, uh, as an example. Uh, but there's an option when you compile your C or C++ to WebAssembly to say, well, actually, uh, allow me to use X amount of memory. So that would help. But again, this would be all dependent on the size of your of the object that we're talking about here. You know, many, many gigabytes, you know, that will take some time to, to process as well. You can also leverage this this file system that I mentioned. Um, so, so there are ways, um, but I don't have a uh, person, I don't have any experience with uh, with larger files on it, you know, a couple of maybe four or five megabyte images, and those were working relatively fast. Cool. Okay, and on a similar note, somebody's asking, is there any overhead in accessing the DOM from WebAssembly in comparison to accessing it using JavaScript directly? Again, I haven't experienced any noticeable delay. Um, the one thing I would add with Go and uh, and WebAssembly, because because that's the place where probably this question came up where I was showing you that from Go you can access the DOM. Um, and you know, don't take it the wrong way. I, I do like Go and I do like the WebAssembly features. What I don't like is that they bring the entire sort of or like a minified version of the Go runtime to your browser. Um, it, it, that is the overhead in, in my in my view, right? It's, it's the JavaScript that you need to include is very very large. Um, so so use some caution there. But again, I don't have you know experience with. A comparable experience with you know hey I'm accessing the DOM using this way and or I'm accessing the DOM that way and whether they perform uh, differently. Cool. Okay. I think it's very much a case of have a play with it and see see what you find, isn't it? Um, yeah. Somebody else is asking how we deal with concurrency in WebAssembly. Um, that's actually a good question. I did read. There was this article, um, where was that? So what I, I tried to find an article for you and I'm going to update the resources section. There was this person who was converting uh, one of his, or one of the, his projects with, at the company where he was working, I think it was a, a Dutch museum, museum's website. So they had this 
website where you could walk in the museum and they would render you know very large 360 degree images in the browser uh, using you know JavaScript and something else and then slowly they transition into using WebAssembly and there's this very lengthy article about what they tried and you know problems with concurrency and using mscript and using these flags and that didn't work um, so there are some options there. So I'll I'll remember to to add that link for you in the resources to to have a look at that. Cool. Thanks for that. So um, you gave us some really good examples using images. Have you got any use cases or examples that are to, not to do with processing images? If you so, my recommendation would be if I just go back. Uh, am I still sharing? Yes, I am. Um, have a look at this Wesen by example page. Uh, or in fact, you know, I can I can go here now. Uh, if I can click this, please go there. Okay. Um, you will find all sorts of examples on this site. Uh, not only just, just images. Um, so you select your languages, so you know, Rust, assembly script, etc. Uh, there are some examples in here, graphics, working with audio. Uh, well, that's it for, for Rust, TinyGo. Okay, it's, it's, it's the same. So it's still uh, graphics and audio. So there are some examples in here. Uh, but if you just Google, you know, WebAssembly use cases, examples, projects, you will find some additional ones. You know, as I said, someone co uh, converted one of the games um, I think it was Doom or maybe Super Mario. I can't remember now. Uh, they ported that. So that's not image. As you saw, there's you know work with audio, uh, work with you know other types of graphics, not just images. Uh, there's there's all sorts of examples. And um, there was one more. Uh, yeah, so I can't do some do some research that there are other use cases for WebAssembly other than than just images i i did use images because you know i, I work at a company that deals a lot with images um but there are some other examples out there cool and the last question is to do with performance again so somebody's asking okay. if the browser is going to use more resources if you're using WebAssembly. um from my experience it's minimal I also recommend that you read this case study that I'm linking to on, on the slide that I'm, I'm sharing at the moment. Uh, that explains, I think, memory consumption as well uh, in terms of WebAssembly. So you can you can actually follow that article uh, and uh, and try to implement some of those suggestions that they say. So you know maybe you have a WebAssembly file already, uh, so you can implement those and you can do some some comparison on your own. Again, because and I think I had this question before as well. Like, can you run WebAssembly with web workers as well? I think the answer is yes. So you could always sort of you know get WebAssembly out from your main thread and, and do the execution somewhere else. So in that sense, again, uh, your performance should not be impacted. And also this article that I mentioned uh, with this you know guy doing the transformation of, of this website, um, he does share, as far as I remember, some very specific details in terms of performance and you know how when he used mscript and generated the WebAssembly, this is how long it took, this is how much memory it was using, etc. And then he I think ultimately went down to use uh went down the route of using uh the TypeScript based uh WASM, so uh, assembly script, and then he shares his insights in terms of performance on there as well. Cool, thanks. And some folks have put some um, examples in the chat, which was really helpful of them. So yeah, yeah thank you. The questions. And they, they were quite challenging this week for some reason. But uh, thank you very That's much fine. for your uh, time to demo all that with us. I really like the way you started off with a very simple example and then, then built it up. So hopefully we'll see you again soon here at uh, CFE. Thank you for having me.